All right, so this is the uh, MEC Minute or the MEC EMS 2022 protocol assessment for January 2022, also known as the Mike and Paul Show. So uh, we're going to review um, the protocol assessment and go through the questions to give our rationale for the answer. So I'm Paul Zeeve and with me is... Hello, Mike Stoner and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. So we're going to go through this and hopefully it's a, a little bit entertaining for you. Uh, and, and just some opening comments, and these are really similar to comments we've done in the past. Um, first, this is an open book review of the protocol. So uh, we have questions that are related to the protocol. We want to use this as a training opportunity, uh, and you are welcome to use the ResponseSoft app or use a paper version of the protocol if you need to for reference. I think it's important that if you have a question about protocol, you take out your, your phone or your tablet and you look it up in the protocol. Uh, you know, right now when I practice medicine, if I have a question, I pick out my, take out my phone and, and go to uh, one of the references I can use to, to refresh my memory. So don't feel bad about looking at, at the protocol on your phone. For us, it will be an open MacBook. We don't have real books anymore. Yeah, open <laughs> MacBook, yeah. Uh, that's true. I mean, I used to wear a white coat only because I needed the pockets for my references. Um, <laughs> Some questions or themes are similar to previous years for emphasis. Uh, you'll notice some questions look either identical to or similar to previous questions or previous years, and that's because uh, they, they reflect on topics that keep coming up as items for discussion and concern. Uh, group participation is encouraged. Uh, I think this is a great way for people to learn. Uh, look at this on the TV together, on the monitor together, discuss the answers and discuss what we're talking about today. Um, this is pass-fail. There is no passing grade, but you have to take the quiz, have to take the assessment. Uh, it's been asked if only paramedics should take the protocol assessment, and my response is anyone who operates under the protocol, whether an EMT, advanced EMT, or paramedic, needs to do this uh, because I think uh, regardless of your level of certification, uh, there's an opportunity to learn. If you're an EMT, this gives you an opportunity to learn and assist the paramedic and help anticipate what the paramedic may need if you're dealing with a difficult patient. So in order to pass this, you have to take the assessment either alone or as a group learning and you have to watch this entire video. Uh, we rely on the company officers to verify participation of the providers. So if you're a company officer, uh, we look to you to make sure your providers uh, review the protocol assessment and review this video. There could be a special code at the end of the video that you have to see. Yeah, yeah. All right, question one. Um, so this is actually based on a real case scenario that I've gotten as one of the phone calls at uh, two o'clock in the morning. Uh, you're called to the home of an 85 year old male. Uh, on your arrival, the daughter meets you who has paperwork indicating she has power of attorney. A uh, patient has recently been diagnosed with metastatic colon cancer and has been bl vomiting blood for the past three hours. Uh, he is unresponsive with shallow respirations and a palpable systolic blood pressure of 60. The daughter indicates that uh, he has been referred to hospice and requests that he not be resuscitated. However, uh, the Ohio DNR paperwork has not been completed. Which action is not appropriate? Okay. Um, I think I might, it should be, it is appropriate. Um, so there's a correction there. It is appropriate. Um, recommend transport to the hospital. Actually, no, I got it worded right. I've got to confuse myself. Recommend transport to hospital assessment and palliative care. Uh, respect the daughter's request and stay with the patient until he dies. Or call the medical director, me, for a verbal DNR order. So uh, really the correct answer uh, is B. So this patient is dying. Um, however, there is no DNR paperwork available. So. Uh, your options are to transport the patient to the hospital for assessment and palliative care, let the hospital sort out whether or not the patient should be resuscitated. Uh, the physician at the hospital has certain rights and responsibilities that you as an EMS provider do not. So one option is to take the patient to the hospital. The other option is to call me uh, and I can give you a verbal order for DNR. So if you look at the state DNR rules, you can take a verbal order to not resuscitate a patient from a physician um, as long as you know who the physician is or can verify the physician's identity. Well, if you call me on the medical control line, you know you're getting me, I can give you a verbal order. It is not appropriate for you to respect the daughter's request and stay with the patient until he dies. Uh, you can do that if you call me and I say make the patient a DNR, but you cannot do that as something as self-directed behavior. 
Keep in mind that a uh, power of attorney is only in effect if a physician determines the patient's not able to make their own health care decisions. Uh, no one has decided that, and based on the scenario I gave you, um, there's no indication that a physician has signed off on the power of attorney. So your options are to either transport or to call a medical director for a verbal DNR. If you give a DNR, can you offer comfort, medical comfort care? Can you give them anything to make them? Yes. So what I can do, uh, what a physician can do as a verbal order is tell you that the state DNR rules are in effect either as a DNR CC or CCA. So you can, and you can do that. You can stay with the patient. You can offer comfort care. But you, uh, the hope I would think is that you know you're not going to spend the next two hours with the patient as they as they uh, as they uh, deteriorate further. So uh, the correct answer is B. Uh, you cannot uh, just stay with the patient until he dies without uh, instituting care unless you receive a verbal order for DNR. Sorry about the confusion of my interpretation of the question that I wrote. Question one. All right. Question two. Patients called, or you are called for a patient who has palpitations and chest pain, a uh, 45-year-old healthy female, has had similar episodes in the past but much briefer, uh, previous, has not been previously evaluated for these symptoms. Um, on your arrival, the patient has a stable uh, blood pressure at 145 over 94. However, you identify that she's tachycardic. Uh, her rhythm strip is to the right. And you know, what are your acceptable options? So what would you do in this circumstance? So would you emergently cardiovert? Uh, would you attempt Valsalva maneuvers? Would you give adenosine intravenously? Would you give cardizem uh, at a dose of 0.25 milligrams per kilogram to a max of 20? Or uh, would you try options B and option D? So uh, from my perspective, and I, this time I'm reading the question correctly, uh, action, uh, option E is, is what you have available. Yes, you could cardiovert the patient, but uh, she is hemodynamically stable, so for our protocol, we don't cardiovert stable patients. In the emergency department, we may elect to do that after we've completed assessment, uh, but not for EMS. You can attempt val Valsalva maneuvers. You can attempt them to see if they change the patient. I suspect you know, this patient, if you look at the rhythm strip, um, she has atrial fibrillation with RVR, so I expect that if you, have, you provide a Valsalva maneuvers, uh, you'll see some slowing of the heart rate, but she won't convert. Uh, on a very rare occasion, I've had that happen to me, um, but I, I, I would not expect anything other than maybe her rate will come down while you're performing a Valsalva maneuver. Um, adenosine IV is good for uh, SVT, uh, but this patient's in, in atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response, so adenosine's probably not going to do anything. I would not waste the meds. Uh, this question's here because we've added Cardizem to the protocol, and um, you know, a uh, patient is going to receive or could receive Cardizem at a dose of 0.25 milligrams per kilogram IV push. I'd give it over a minute or two, and that should slow her heart rate down. So uh, for you in the field, the options are um, uh, E. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see that we've added Cardizem to the protocol. So uh, at the bottom there, if the patient has acute atrial fibrillation, um, uh, with the RVR, then you can use Cardizem. I would not give Cardizem unless the patient is tachycardic. So I would expect the patient uh, be over, I, for me, I don't use it unless it's over 120, 130 beats per minute. So Cardizem is the new drug. Uh, it can be used um, and use it safely. Just keep in mind that you should read the drug information sheet on Cardizem. We did a talk about it as part of the uh, up protocol update in December. Um, the biggest concern about Cardizem is patients can become bradycardic and a little hypotensive, so just be aware of that. And if the patient has any history of uh, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome or WPW, uh, do not give them Cardizem. Uh, either transport or if they're hemodynamically unstable, uh, sedate and cardiovert. So I think we have a PEDS question come up. We do. All right. Question three. Qu uh, Seven-year-old male with a uh, peanut allergy was at a birthday party balloons, pinatas, the whole nine yards, and had some food with peanuts in it. Uh, you find him, he's got a diffuse urticarial rash, and he has vomiting. What do you do? So you have four choices here. Uh, give him a dose of uh, Benadryl, IM, uh, weight-based. Uh, give him a dose of uh, Zofran, because he's vomiting, I dance to try to give him some oral dicanhydramine or Benadryl. Give him IM epi, or put an IV in and give him a 20 cc per kilo bolus. 
So the correct answer here is C. So this is uh, anaphylaxis, and to prove it otherwise, he's got two systems. If he just had an urticaria rash, I would say make him comfortable with the rash, but he's got some GI symptoms. Uh, you know, or, or, um, anaphylaxis usually has the rash, but we'll have a second system. GI, vomiting, respiratory, some wheezing, some angioedema in the mouth are all kind of things that push me over the edge to call it anaphylaxis. And the drug of choice, I guess the only drug, is, uh, is epinephrine. Benadryl, it's a nice thing to have, <coughs> thing to have, but it's no treatment. So, C. All right. And, and, you know, I think we've been talking about this for a number of years, but you, you suspect anaphylaxis, the first thing you do is epinephrine. Epi. All right, question four. Uh, you have a 32-year-old uh, or thirty-two year old who is uh, gravid of five, para four, currently 35 weeks gestation, complaining of headache and abdominal pain. Her blood pressure is elevated at 190 over 110, um, and uh, you know the baby seems to be active. The uterine fundus is appropriately sized and is non-tender. Um, she has uh, ankle edema, pedal edema, pretibial edema, uh, and the question is, what are you going to do to treat this patient? So uh, I think if you look at this patient, you know the key thing here is she's got edema and she's hypertensive. She has preeclampsia until proven otherwise and we have to think about the bad things can happen with this patient. So what are we gonna do? Uh, well, we're gonna do all of these. So we're gonna transport the patient uh, to a hospital with OB capabilities. This is not a candidate for a freestanding institution, a freestanding ED. She needs to go to a hospital where OB can assess the patient soon and early. Uh, matter of fact, depending on where you transport, this patient may go directly to labor and delivery uh, rather than to the emergency department, but the receiving facility will determine that. Uh, place the patient left lateral decubitus position. Uh, you know, you patient put the patient on the left side. They get this big heavy uterus, uh, big baby, off of the inferior vena cava, which improves venous return. Uh, it's one of the cornerstones of managing patients uh, with this condition. And we're going to start the patient on a, a magnesium sulfate uh, infusion over 20 minutes. Um, so our protocol calls for two grams over 20 minutes. That's pretty safe uh, dose and a dosing. Uh, interval. Uh, at the hospital, they'll probably give additional two mil or two grams uh, over 20 minutes and then start an infusion. Um, typically, the hospital will start with four grams, but I think for pre-hospital providers, two grams is a good, safe place to start uh, because if you give uh, mag sulfate too fast, you're at risk for respiratory depression. Um, and if the IV infusion gets away from you, uh, two grams is not going to hurt the patient, whereas four grams might. So the answer is all of the above. This is looking at our um, uh, protocol, and you know we refined this some compared to uh, last year. Um, so uh, we have five categories of what we included as part of preeclampsia or pregnancy-induced hypertension. So hypertension alone with a blood pressure over 140 over 90, or a systolic increase of 15 millimeters or more above the patient's baseline. Uh, hypertension, proteinuria, and edema, you know, we don't do urine dipsticks in the field, but if they have protein in your urine uh, and they're uh, in their last uh, trimester or so of pregnancy, we consider that uh, an indicator of uh, preeclampsia. Uh, severe preeclampsia with definition there. Um, eclampsia is basically preeclampsia plus seizures. So if you look at our protocol, we're going to stop the seizure with uh, benzo and then we're going to give magnesium. And then there's a HELP syndrome, which you probably may hear about, but you're not going to diagnose it in the field, which has to do with uh, elevated blood pressure, but also hemolysis, that's red blood cell breakdown, abnormal liver function studies, and low platelets, which are a component of our blood, have to do with clotting, and that's caused the help, called the HELP syndrome. But the new thing for this year is we've added mag sulfate for any patient who meets criteria for preeclampsia. So if they have edema and or hypertension at their last uh, trimester of pregnancy, we're going to give them mag sulfate even if they have not had a seizure. So we're going to start treatment sooner. Uh, and I think that's the big change and that's why this question's in the protocol uh, assessment. This is great stuff. Last week I was in delivering, there was a, a simulated pregnant woman in our emergency department we were doing a I stumbled upon a simulation, and what I know about pregnant women is call you guys to take them to another hospital besides mine. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I but learned they, a lot. But they may still seize in your emergency yeah. department or seize up on the floor. Right. So this is good. Yes, because it can be after pregnancy too. Yeah. So mag sulfate for us in the field is really uh, being used for multiple reasons now. 
the big important change I want to remind you is the patient has preeclampsia but no seizure. Preeclampsia, they qualify for mag sulfate. Um, so for the same patient, what do you do during transport while uh, maintaining the mag sulfate infusion? Monitor the respiratory rate, monitor deep tendon reflexes, have, cal have calcium chloride available, uh, or notify the receiving hospital, uh, receiving obstetrical unit that you're bringing the patient in. Well, the, the answer really is E. So if you look at the biggest side effect of mag sulfate and it's adverse for the patient, it's gonna depress the patient's respiratory rate. Uh, two grams, less likely to do that than four grams, which is why we're going with two. Uh, a lot of things we'll do to monitor the patient during infusion is the deep tendon reflexes. So you know, if, if you tap their uh, patellar uh, tendon and their knee jerks, well, that's good. If their knee jerks before the infusion but stops jerking after you've given the infusion, need to watch for toxicity from magnesium sulfate. So loss of deep tendon reflexes is an early indicator of magnesium toxicity. If the patient becomes mag sulfate toxic, calcium chloride is the antagonist. I think it's unlikely you're gonna have that issue, but it's a good thing to know, uh, regardless of the reason for magnesium. So give the patient magnesium drip because they're uh, in bronchospasm, uh, you still have to worry about uh, respiratory depression. It's a good idea to watch the reflexes and think about calcium chloride as the antidote. And again, if your patient is pregnant and getting mag sulfate because they're preeclamptic or eclamptic, the receiving hospital needs to know sooner rather than later so obstetrics can be available. Many hospitals, OB staff will come down and meet you in the emergency department and escort you upstairs. So the answer for this is E, all of the above. Is that still true if it's postpartum? Like postpartum, uh, with out? patients, uh, for depending on who you talk to, four to six weeks postpartum, they're still at risk for preeclampsia and eclampsia. Would OB take them? OB will take them, uh, unless they have other reasons. So, you know, if uh, the patient ha comes in and um, they're very hypertensive and it looks like they have uh, preeclampsia because of edema and protein in the urine, we'll start them on the magnesium and send them to L and D. If they have any other reason, like uh, if they have uh, postpartum cardiomyopathy, they're going to stay in the ED and get admitted to a medical bed. But yes, uh, for that patients, good point, patients can, are still at risk for preeclampsia and eclampsia uh, four to six weeks postpartum. Uh, another, question. Another Pete's question. All right, you were called to a two-year-old decreased level of consciousness. On arrival, the patient is difficult to arouse and has some cyanosis, has respiratory rate, which is weak and at eight a minute, heart rate of 112, and just pinpoint pupils. Uh, you ask the mom, and she says the kid has really been healthy, is not sick at all. Uh, the mom really does know, not know much about what's going on because uh, um, she has been out. And she knows the kid was playing in the bathroom, but mom just had ankle surgery yesterday. Um, what is your next appropriate step? So this is kind of one of those what am I thinking questions. Um, your options are blow by oxygen, intubate, give uh, intranasal, Narcan, or put in an IO. And the answer is the Narcan. So the what am I thinking part is you have respiratory suppression, you have pinpoint pupils, so it fits um, an opiate overdose. She's two, so most two-year-olds aren't out there trying to find out when they're getting their next fix. Um, but she was playing in the bathroom, mom just had surgery, she probably went home with a, a bunch of narcotics and she's not been watching the child. So pills look like candy to a lot of kids and uh, they will try to eat them. So a little bit of thinking outside the box, but she presents with a, uh, an opiate overdose picture, so that would be step one. However, step two might be oxygen. Yeah, right, and she may, she may need oxygen and then access and an extra airway, but uh, yeah. give, give C a try. Yeah, key question is next. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay, so we have a behavioral emergency. So if you've been paying attention over the past year, you're aware, you should be aware that we're spending a lot of time and attention to behavioral emergencies, particularly in terms of how we treat them. And to a large extent, this is because of things that have happened in Colorado, uh, where a, a uh, person was dis, uh, taken into custody by, for, by police for really, from my perspective, suspect reasons. Patient was... Uh, uh, became hostile, he was controlled by the cops, and on EMS arrival, he was medicated with ketamine with adverse effects. So uh, we have here a 25-year-old male su suffering a behavioral emergency. He's anxious and agitated with occasional outbursts. 
So what is his score on the sedation assessment tool? Is it zero, plus one, plus two, or plus three? Well, the correct answer is plus two. So I, I think the reasonable question is, you know, why? Well, let's we'll walk through that on the next slide. So his his uh, score is a plus two, and if he has a plus two, uh, how are we going to medicate this patient? So uh, are we going to give him midazolam, ten milligrams IM? Are we going to give him ketamine, four milligrams IM, four milligrams per kilogram IM? Ketamine, two milligrams per kilogram IM, or midazolam, five milligrams intranasally. So the correct answer is C. So how do we come up with this? Well, this is the sedation assessment tool. Um, this is a tool that uh, probably about six medical directors in Franklin County have identified as a way of assessing patients. So out of our concern about the way things have been going in Colorado uh, with ketamine, where it's now illegal for EMS to administer ketamine for behavioral emergencies, um, we felt that it was best if we came up with a common means to assess and medicate patients with behavioral emergencies. And we came up with the sedation assessment tool. It's a validated tool uh, from our perspective. It's the, one of the easiest tools we can use to assess patient agitation. So this patient is very anxious with loud outbursts, so he would be a, uh, a two. And if you look at our treatment algorithm that's in the protocol, uh, we're going to, we have several options. So we can give the patient uh, midazolam intravenously at five milligrams, uh, and this is an adult patient. Um, or uh, we can give the patient midazolam 10 milligrams intranasally or intramuscularly. Or we can give them ketamine that's based on a uh, dose per kilo. And uh, so for a plus two, the patient can get one milligram per kilogram IV or two milligrams per kilogram IM. Uh, this has been updated in the ResponseSoft app. So if you enter the patient's weight into the app um, and enter the weight as hopefully kilograms, but if it's pounds, it'll convert for you. And it will, it will do the conversion for you and tell you what the dose is. So uh, our dose is gonna be a milligram per kilogram IV or two milligrams per kilogram IM. Um, and uh, we're not calling for intranasal doses of ketamine. Uh, so if you look at it, uh, from my perspective, I probably would give either the midazolam IM or the ketamine IM. I don't think I'd worry about trying to obtain access in this patient. Um, and I would just give it intramuscularly. Most patients don't like you going at their nose with the medication, particularly if they're agitated. So for me, I would go with one of the intramuscular options, which is either midazolam IM or ketamine IM. And this, this is also similar for kids, and the weight dosing will, would go through there too. Question right. nine. You're called at 2 a.m. for a three-year-old with shortness of breath. On scene, the patient has moderate respiratory distress with global retractions, a barky cough, and has an inspiratory strider. Uh, the mom says the child's pretty healthy, uh, was maybe had a little runny nose when he went to bed, but um, has otherwise, otherwise been well. What do you do now? So this is a picture of a child who's got croup. Why 2 a.m.? Because that's when all croup kids seem to show up. So your options are racemic epi, um, aerosolized, and then tell the patient the sh mom should drive her to the emergency department. Uh, racemic epi, dexa, um, dexamethasone, and then take the child to the emergency department. Uh, just give them some oral dexamethasone, or IM, and transfer them to ED, or um, do the epinephrine, the dexamethasone, and uh, tell the mother to drive the kid to the emergency department. Answer is, okay, lots to talk about, not really. So. If a child is not in distress, I guess there's two medicines that are on the board here, the racemic epi and the, um, the steroid, or the uh, decadron dexamethasone. So uh, the treatment for croup is time. The child's immune system will fix it. The short-term treatment is going to be um, the steroid. It's gonna shrink the tissue in the airway and allow them to breathe. It lasts about two to three days, and the illness lasts about that long, so they equal out. Racemic epi is a bridge, and if somebody is in distress, as we mentioned in this case scenario, uh, they have strider, they're going to need the racemic epi. So that's where that one is. So the acute issue is the strider with this closing airway, so that's where the racemic epi comes in. The longer term issue is the, uh, 
the swelling that's going to take some time. That's where the steroid comes in. And then finally, you do get a bounce back effect from the semic epi. Can, I guess is a better term. So if you uh, give them epi, they breathe well, give them some decadron, and you say sayonara, it's likely to happen in an hour or less. They may bounce back and have more strider and um, will be in a, a little bit of trouble. So don't just leave them there. Take them to the emergency department. Uh, we'll sit there and we'll watch them for a couple hours. If they need more racemic epi, we'll give it to them. Our goal is just to watch them until the decadron starts to kick in and then we'll get them home. But I would not leave them. So the answer is pretty much all the above, which is B. Yeah, yeah, yeah just to reinforce, uh, if you uh, administer racemic epi, it's mandatory transport. There's no declination. Uh, and uh, we give dexamethasone in the field because it helps shorten the length of stay at the hospital. Yeah. Uh, so if we give to the patient, you know, 30 more minutes before you get to the hospital, uh, we've, we've saved children's 30 minutes. 30 minutes. So, uh, you know, do not expect the dexamethasone in itself to be effective uh, during your transport, but it does make a total difference in terms of, or difference in terms of total, total treatment times for, for children. Right. And I have PO and IM up there, they're equally efficacious. And kids apparently like medicine in their mouth and their arm or butt. Yeah. yeah. And we just use the IV steroids to just yeah. get the child to drink it. A teaspoon of sugar makes the It's medicine. delicious. All right. Um, you have a 25 year old male whose driver and auto involved an auto accident in the freeway, non ambulatory, has an obvious left femur fracture, no spinal tenderness, is not intoxicated, has no lower logical impairment. Is a cervical collar indicated? Yes or no? So, this is a, this question has been on the protocol assessment. If this is not the second, third year, it's at least the second year because it keeps coming up in terms of the clinical care we provide in the field. So this patient uh, deserves a cervical collar. And you know, the key thing is that box in the middle. Uh, an unreliable patient uh, has an acute stress reaction. So if it's somebody who's freaking out at the scene because they trashed their parent's car, uh, they're an unreliable patient. Any patient with a head injury, any patient with altered LLC, any patient's intoxicated, um, they're all unreliable. But the last uh, uh, bullet point is, distracting injury. Uh, there's no way you convince me that a femur fracture is not a distracting injury. Um, so they are going to be preoccupied with the pain that's coming from their femur and their ability to provide a reliable exam is low. So any type of distracting injury um, requires the patient be placed in a cervical collar. Um, and this question is, like I said, it keeps showing up because we have patients arriving in the trauma bay who have distracting injuries, um, significant mechanism of injury, and there's no cervical collar. So when in doubt, put the collar on. Um, anything that may distract the patient from really paying attention to how their neck feels, um, anything that may uh, prevent them from uh, responding in an appropriate way to your assessment needs a cervical collar. Um, those patients will have uh, multi-level imaging at the hospital, CT, maybe even MRI of the cervical spine before they'll take the collar off. So have a very low threshold uh, for cervical immobilization. I like it. And you see the same thing in children? See the same thing in children. Yeah. Nobody likes a collar, no. but nobody wants to be uh, quadriplegic either. Um, you're preparing to transport a 60-year-old male who was last normal 10 minutes prior to dispatch. He has right facial droop, aphasia, is unable to lift his right arm, and has no grasp in the right hand. Finger stick blood sugar is 95, no history of head injury or anticoagulant use. Where should you transport the patient? And all of the facilities that we have as option have a transport time of 15 minutes or less. Should you go to the closest hospital? Should you go to the, which could also be the closest freestanding, or, mm -hmm. um, could you go to the uh, uh, primary stroke center or should you go to a comprehensive stroke center? So uh, the, uh, really the answer here is C. So this patient has a uh, significant stroke. All facilities are fairly close and you can get to a comprehensive stroke center, which is the highest level of stroke care within a relatively short period of time. 
So if you look at our, our protocol, uh, we base our destination decision for stroke patients on the LA Motor scale. There are other scales out there. Um, really none have been shown to be uh, uh, better than the other. Uh, so we use the LAMP score, which is also what Columbus uses and most other Central Ohio EMS agencies use just because we want to be consistent. So if we look at our patient, uh, he's got facial weakness or drift or droop. He's got arm weakness, he can't move it, and he's got no grip. So he's got a LAMS of five. Uh, our protocol requires that any patient with a LAMS of four or five go to the closest comprehensive uh, stroke center if you can get there in, uh, I think, 30 minutes or less. So, you know, get there, it's to the patient's benefit. Um, this patient is more likely to have a lesion that is amenable to clot extraction and a uh, better outcome. So if they arrive in the emergency department at a comprehensive stroke center, they're gonna get quick imaging, just like at a primary. Uh, they'll probably get TPA quickly, just like at a primary. But if they have additional imaging, which we do, and they show a large vessel occlusion, they're gonna go for a clot extraction, which has been shown to be uh, the ultimate in terms of best patient outcome. So the big difference between primary and comprehensive is interventional radiology? Interventional radiology and uh, more likely have advanced neurosurgical capabilities too. So if they need a if they need coiling or clipping for a subarachnoid, they have that available. Uh, some patients have things like um, carotid uh, stenosis that might require intervention as well. So the scope of services is uh, much greater at a comprehensive facility. Really, for me, a lot of this is like uh, STEMI care was 20 years ago, where everybody got thrombolytics uh, and then went for intervention after that. Um, now we don't give thrombolytics anymore. We just yep. go into the cath lab and take out clot. Okay, uh, another DNR question. So you have an elderly female complaining of severe chest pain and dyspnea. Her O2 sat is 86% on room air. She's diaphoretic with a blood pressure of 154 over 90 and her pulse is 42. The daughter hands you an Ohio DNR form that is signed by a physician indicates the patient's a DNR CC. So the patient has a valid Ohio DNR form which is in effect and which you must follow. So which actions are prohibited? IV fentanyl for pain control, transcutaneous pacemaker application, cardiac monitoring, CPAP, or um, I, actions B and D, or I'm sorry, B and C are prohibited. So you cannot pace and you cannot monitor. So the correct answer is E. So this patient probably does not need a pacemaker uh, with a blood pressure 154 over 90, but you don't know, her pressure may drop. So uh, based on the Ohio DNRCC rules, you cannot use pacemakers uh, and you cannot start cardiac monitoring. Uh, you can check blood pressure, you can do vital signs. Um, you can provide pain control, whether it's intravenous or intranasal or intramuscular. You can provide CPAP. So CPAP and BiPAP are allowed procedures for DNRCC patients. But you cannot intubate, you cannot pace, and you cannot monitor. Uh, you can, from my perspective, use a cardiac monitor to determine death. So if you think the patient has died, uh, you can use the monitor to verify asystole. But you cannot use cardiac monitoring with the intent of, of acting on any arrhythmias that may develop. So the answer, the prohibited actions are pacemaker application and cardiac monitoring. Okay, uh, another question, this one has to do with law enforcement. So law enforcement calls you to assist with a 77-year-old male who was found in the middle of a cornfield in his underwear. Uh, ambient temperature is 20 degrees. So right now as we're recording this, I think my watch says it's 21 degrees. So similar to right now. Mm -hmm. Patient's awake, alert, and oriented times four. Uh, he does not want to be transported to the hospital. What actions do you do to determine if this patient has capacity to refuse care? So when the patient refuses, you know, it's up to us to determine whether or not they can make an informed decision. So what are you going to do to determine uh, capacity? Are you going to check his vital signs and his blood sugar? Are you going to outline your concerns to the patient, ask him to recount or paraphrase your concerns? Are you going to offer him a blanket? Are you going to assess for intoxication or head injury? So. What do you think? So this is one of those things where I think all of the above apply. So I think you know basic uh, care is that you're gonna check his vital signs and check his blood sugar. If the patient's hypoglycemic, uh, he probably lacks capacity. Um, you're gonna outline your concerns to the patient, ask him to recount or paraphrase your concerns. For me, this is what I focus on when I determine if a patient's got capacity. 
if they can uh, listen to what I have to say and then recount what I have to say and what my concerns are, then I, I think they're more likely to have capacity to make an informed decision. Sometimes you can kind of sneak things in on the questions, you know, on the patient. You know, if you offer the patient a blanket and the patient says, I don't need that or I don't want that, and he's outside naked and it's 20 degrees in the middle of a cornfield, that makes me wonder if he really lacks capacity. Does he really understand the circumstance he's in? So if the patient says, I don't want that blanket, um, then I would really wonder whether or not the patient's got the capacity to refuse. I mean, any person in a reasonable state of mind who's outside in 20 degrees weather uh, should, from my perspective, accept a blanket. And then the last thing is assess the patient for intoxication or head injury. If the patient's got a large hematoma on their forehead uh, and some of the other things don't add up, uh, then they may also lack capacity. So to me, all these things are reasonable things to do uh, to determine whether or not the patient has capacity. Um, for me, I would not rely on the patient being awake alert oriented times four. Uh, most physicians, most seasoned paramedics would say that in itself uh, it may be part of our assessment, but it's not the only thing we could do to determine if the patient has the capacity to make an informed decision. So for me, answer is E. I want to know the backstory. How do you end up in a cornfield in his underwear? Oh, I'll make something <laughs> up. Maybe, maybe he saw his ex-wife running through the fields. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe his dog got out and he went after the dog. Oh. Uh, for me, I would wait till the dog decided it was cold enough yeah. to come back in. But, I mean, and, and maybe, you know, you're right. The backstory sometimes in itself says the patient has, doesn't have capacity. Yeah. You know, uh, I was going with D. He was intoxicated at the bar. He lost his shirt and yeah, I lost his shirt and gave a strip poker yeah. and uh, <laughs> decided to go walking home. Uh, yeah, and sometimes the backstory is also important because yeah. sometimes the backstory. Good point. I mean, the backstory itself doesn't make sense for him leaving the house to begin with. If it includes aliens, take yeah. him in. Yeah, take him in. <laughs> Okay, uh, in our protocol, calcium chloride is indicated for the treatment of dialysis patients in cardiac arrest, bradycardia due to calcium channel blocker overdose, uh, depressed respirations follow, uh, following IV mag sulfate infusion, or eclampsia. So what's the correct answer? Well, the correct answer is E. So eclampsia is not an indication for mag sulfate, or I'm sorry, for calcium chloride. Um, we use magnesium sulfate. However, if we give magnesium sulfate and now they have depressed respirations, which is uh, answer C, yes, we could use calcium chloride then. For a good number of years, we've had calcium chloride in the protocol for the treatment of dialysis patients and cardiac arrest. And for several years, we've had it as an indication uh, for bradycardia due to calcium channel blocker overdose. Uh, and you know, uh, B is even more important now that we've got cardiozem intravenously available for AFib. So if you give somebody a dose of Cardizem, and now they're uh, for some reason back in sinus and their pulse rate is 30, uh, yeah, we probably ought to give them some calcium. So uh, answers here is A, B, and C, which are all correct. The clamps in itself is not an indication for calcium chloride. Okay, this is another question that keeps coming back because we still have issues with medication errors. So you are assisting the charge medic with patient care. Charge medic indicates he's going to administer a dose of fentanyl IV for peen. Um, you notice the patient or the, notice the medic's opened a vial uh, of ketamine instead of fentanyl. What should you do? This is a real life case uh, from a couple years ago. Uh, so what should you do as the other provider? And this is important whether you're an EMT, advanced, or paramedic. Uh, assist in medication administration. Take out the BVM in case the patient stops breathing. Speak up, point out uh, the medic's mistake. Suggest you and the medic and the charge medic follow our protocol and medication cross check. Well, for me, the answer is E. Um, you know, uh, it, uh, we expect everybody to participate in the safe administration of medications. If you see a mistake or think there may be a mistake being made either in cal dose calculations or pulling the wrong medication, you should speak up and point out the mistake. And we have the cross-check procedure in the policy, in the protocol. It's been there for at least five years. And uh, the idea is to correctly identify the, the medication to identify any errors. And we have had issues of errors uh, usually related to Versed, ketamine, uh, and fentanyl. Uh, either the vials look similar or it's an error in concentration 
Uh, you know, uh, midazolam we have is five milligrams per ml and one milligram per ml. Um, the five milligrams per ml is meant for intranasal or intramuscular, whereas the one per one is meant for IV. Um, you, the medic may uh, calculate the correct dose, correct number of milligrams, but because of concentration differences, pulls up the wrong amount of medication. So everybody should be aware and cross-check. Uh, we have had a patient who got IV ketamine instead of fentanyl, and he had a brief respiratory arrest. Um, for what he got, it was unusual, but he still had the arrest, and the wrong medication was given. Um, so uh, it's something to keep in mind. Those are avoidable questions, and really we don't like to have to advise the patient we overdosed them on the medication. So yeah. cross-checks are important. Um, this is the question that's come up. You're caring for a 24-year-old male who suffered TBI after being struck in the head with a baseball bat. His GCS is 8, so for most of us, GCS of 8 and less gets intubated. Uh, you intubate the patient. Um, which of the following associated with worst outcome? And we've talked about this on previous MEC minutes. So episodes of hypoxia, uh, IV TXA, an episode of hypotension, or hyperventilation following endotracheal tube placement. So which of these items have been associated with worse patient outcomes who suffer traumatic brain injury? The answer is, is A, C, and D. So if you, if you look at it, um, it's kind of like the, the three H-bombs of TBI. Uh, the first has to do with hypoxia. So any episode of hypoxia in the pre-hospital arena is associated with a worse outcome. So monitor patient's oxygen saturation with pulse ox. If you have to administer high flow oxygen, do so before you intubate. You know, we have our DSI protocol and we have it to avoid hypoxia. Um, avoid hypotension. So if a patient becomes hypotension, um, we've had decreased or get decreased uh, cerebral blood flow, which results in worse outcome. Studies out of Arizona have shown that if a patient has a TBI and suffers both hypoxia and hypotension in the pre-hospital arena, their outcome is six times worse than if they had neither of these episodes. So if the patient uh, is well uh, oxygenated and does not develop hypotension, their outcome is six times better if the patient's suffered a period of hypoxia and hypotension in the pre-hospital arena. Those are avoidable problems. And the last thing is hyperventilation. We know that if we hyperventilate or hypoventilate, the patient is gonna have a worse outcome. So uh, our goal is with an intubated patient maintaining an end tidal CO2 of 35 to 40. Uh, use the two finger technique when you bag and use a rate timer. We, try, we should shoot for um, uh, ventilating the patient uh, via the endotracheal tube every six seconds or 10 ventilations per minute. Uh, and we need to optimize the end tidal CO2. So those are the three H-bombs of, of TBI. I think our, uh, our intubation, our DSI protocol is so robust with hypoxia. This kid's not crashing. It's just you need to get a tube in him, but not yesterday. Yeah. So I think you have time. So these are great points to yeah. kind of hammer on. And our, our uh, um, monitors are so advanced now. You have capnography. I think you see it in the younger kids a little bit more too because you there's a bit more anxiety component from the little leaguer who's playing gets hit in the head and has the yep. same problem and then all of a sudden you're like oh it's a kid and I'm bagging away really fast and I'm going to do it faster faster and all of a sudden his CO2 is negative numbers yeah so. yeah and we saw it I, I'm old enough to remember when the, the, the thought was you hyperventilate, hyperventilate yeah. all head injuries so the lower you can blow them the better but now keep in mind the state now requires that for any airway procedures that meet, involves a supraglottic device or an endotracheal tube, they must, at least in the pre-hospital arena, must be on cap, uh, entitled CO2 reads. So you have to do that. Uh, for a 24-year-old, if uh, we oxygenate the 24-year-old well, if you look at the oxygenation desaturation curve, we probably have five to seven minutes to get a tube in on this patient before they start desatting. So, you know, if we can get this kid or this 24-year-old well oxygenated, we pro it probably buys us f at least five minutes of apnea. Not suggesting we should be comfortable with five minutes of apnea, but we have a cushion there that prevents hypoxia. All right. I think this one's mine. This is me. You? This is mine. Okay. Yeah. So this is a 14-year-old trauma patient, but you can jump in there too. Um, well, actually, this is probably not yours because she's pregnant. 
So uh, call EMS. Yeah, call EMS. You have an injured <laughs> person. You find a 14-year-old female on the ground moaning in pain. Her friend tells you the patient is seven months pregnant and fell off the horse. After I wrote this, I'm wondering what would a 14-year-old be doing on a horse if they're seven months pregnant? Sorry, yeah. But 14-year-olds, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Um, so she fell off a horse. Uh, on assessment, she's got a blood pressure of 88 over 60. Her pulse is 110. The uterus is enlarged and mildly tender. She has a widened, tender pelvis. So she's got an open book fracture of the pelvis. Um, no other injuries are immediately identified. Which action is incorrect? So you're going to obtain IV access and give a fluid bolus. You know, we do have the permissive hypotension, but, you know, we are going to give her some fluids. Uh, are we going to apply a pelvic sling? Are we going to give TXA? Are we going to transport her with her body tilted to the left? And are we going to transport her to a hospital with OB capability? So which action is incorrect? Which things should you not do? And the answer for us is TXA, because right now TXA is not indicated in a patient who is pregnant. Um, you know, if the patient might be pregnant or is, is, you know, in the first trimester and you don't know they're pregnant and you give them TXA, okay, that's all right. But if they're known to be pregnant, uh, protocol does not allow TXA. However, we are going to give IV fluids, uh, you know, follow our permissive hypotension protocol. We have just uh, brought on the pelvic sling, so we're going to add that to our protocol to tighten up that pelvis. Whether the patient's pregnant or not, if they have an open book fracture, they're gonna lose a couple units of blood into the pelvis. Uh, we can reduce the amount of uh, blood loss by closing the pelvis with the pelvic sling. Uh, we're gonna put the patient in the kind of a left lateral decubitus position, uh, maybe on a backboard to keep her from falling. Uh, but if we tilt her to the left, we're gonna get the uterus off the uh, inferior vena cava, which improves venous return to the heart. And this patient definitely needs to go to a trauma hospital that's got obstetrical capabilities because we're taking care of two patients here, not one. So this child or this patient may end up needing an urgent or emergent cesarean section depending on what they find at the hospital. I like that. Uh E, that was for me, so that with OB capabilities. Yeah, this, which is why it's my, <laughs> my question, not yeah. yours. <laughs> uh, 18. All right, this is a trauma question from Dr. Dazon. Uh, which of the following scenarios are deemed inappropriate exceptions to transport patients to the closest trauma center? So, you know, if you look at the trauma, uh, trauma triage rules, there are five exceptions to transport to a trauma facility. So... Which, uh, which is an inappropriate exception? So adverse weather conditions or, adverse or excessive transport times. The trauma center is unable to accept the injured victim without undue delay. Uh, transporting the victim uh, to a trauma center would cause a shortage of local EMS resources. Or a trauma center of further proximity is preferred by the transport providers. So which is the, correct, which is the incorrect? The incorrect answer is D. Uh, and if you look at the trauma triage rules, uh, you know, uh, these are the five exceptions. So weather conditions are an exception. You know, we have had at times when uh, we're, uh, we can almost see uh, a non-trauma facility um, and, and the weather is bad and we go to that facility because if we, you know, if it's got eight inches of snow on the ground trying to get to a trauma facility, it's going to take us an hour and a half on, a, on, uh, on the road. So we're going to go to the closest appropriate facility for stabilization. Or if trauma center can declare they're unable to accept additional patients, uh, so a trauma center can uh, selectively divert. Uh, <clears throat> uh, or uh, transporting to a trauma center would cause a shortage of local EMS resources. So uh, the state does recognize that if it's going to take, you know, if your jurisdiction has one transport truck and going to a trauma center is going to take you out of service for 90 to 120 minutes, but a closer hospital is available, you can go there. Uh, the trauma triage rules do not allow providers to go to a preferred hospital. So the expectation is if you have a trauma patient, they should go to the closest trauma facility. Um, personal preference doesn't rule. Uh, we, uh, we as EMS providers do not certify trauma centers. That's done by the American College of Surgeons with sign off through the state. So if the patient or the hospital is a designated trauma facility, they should get, take that patient unless uh, there are exclusions to going there. So. Um, you know, personal preference does not determine look, uh, which, which hospital receives the patient. According to Ohio Trauma Triage Decision Rules, geriatrics is defined as Old. 60 and up, 65 and up, 70 and up, 75 and up. 
So fortunately, I don't quite hit the rule yet. The answer is 70. So trauma triage rules apply for 70 and up. Uh, be aware because there are some uh, uh, changes there. All right, 20. Uh, Four-year-old, history of severe persistent asthma has been evaluated and he is noted to be in significant distress. Breathing at 50, 52 times a minute, global retractions, he cannot speak in full sentences. Um, you immediately start albuterol, uh, ipitropium, which is atrovent, and you're thinking, what do I do next? So the question is, which of the following is an appropriate thing to consider? Um, I'll back up a little bit and uh, let me read the answer. So, place an IV and give uh, IV steroids, dexamethasone. Give oral dexamethasone. Start the patient on CPAP. This goes back to our new CPAP protocol we added last year. Uh, give uh, a dose of IMEPI or all are appropriate to consider. Um, the answer is E. When you speak of asthma, you kind of have a, a huge toolbox of things that you can run to. Steroids are a must, and this is similar to the question we talked about with, um, with, or with uh, croup. The quicker you get steroids in, the better off uh, the kid's gonna, outcome is gonna be. Um, hopefully, turn around and it will decrease uh, hospital uh, admissions, or at least ICU admissions. Um, but we've started the CPAP protocol, so that is in there, uh, if you think he needs it. I think in this scenario, my first thing I would grab would be IMEPI. But to answer the question correctly, all of them are, are options. You can put an IV and give them steroids. You can give them steroids by mouth. Um, and then uh, you can start them on CPAP. And also IMF is a quick, I'm going to fix it now while I'm getting the rest of my tools out of my toolbox. Um, part of the question, unable to speak full sentences, that's a great way to assess patients. I try to teach our residents that as well, is, you know, have them say the alphabet. Kids at four are just learning the alphabet and love to show off their new skills. So if you ask him to say the alphabet and he gets to E uh, in one breath, then you are dealing with a pretty significant case. And I, I use that too uh, in adults. I mean, if somebody says a shorter breath and they're talking at me in full paragraphs, uh, that's a whole yeah. lot different than somebody who can give me two or three words at a yeah. time. Two or three words between gasps. I so. am trying to. <laughs> yes, yeah. And, I, and I, I'll put that in as part of my, as part of my assessment, you know. Patient, patient is dyspneic and only speak in phrases. Or patient claims to be dyspneic but is speaking in full paragraphs. So it's, a good, it's a good thing to document. Dr. Zeeb so far ahead of me. I get to the alphabet and said. Well, I, <laughs> and sometimes I regret asking the question because I'm waiting for the paragraph to end. Uh, quick question. What, uh, when do you give nitro paste to a patient experiencing chest pain? So do you give it with the first dose of nitro or the first... Uh, you know, first spray or tablet, you give it the second dose, the third dose, um, or after the third dose. So really, if you look at our protocol, we give it with the first dose. So, so if you think the patient is having anginal chest pain, the patient's got a STEMI on their EKG and you start nitrates. Uh, if, the vital, if the blood pressure is acceptable for nitrates, uh, we're going to uh, to apply topical nitrates at the same time we give the first nitro tablet. The reason we do that is the cutaneous absorption takes some time and it works. Um, the other thing is, and it has nothing to do with this question, but there's often the question about um, patients with acute inferiors versus anteriors and nitrates. Um, you know, should we not give uh, nitrates for inferiors? Uh, I would say really don't give nitrates if they're hypotensive. Try a mild fluid bolus if clinically they're not in heart failure. Uh, don't worry about whether it's anterior or inferior. Uh, there have been several studies posted where actually the incidence of hypotension is higher with anteriors than with inferiors after nitrates. So uh, I think um, clinically, in the pre-hospital world, it's been uh, proven that nitrates are safe in inferior MIs. That the key point is whether or not they're hypotensive. You just wipe it off if they become hypotensive? Yeah, if, you can wipe it off and it's gone. Oh, this is yours. It's mine? You don't do obstetrics, but this is yours. All right. Uh, you are called to assist another unit with a pregnant woman. On arrival, the baby is crowning, uh, and the other team states that they will handle the patient and ask if you can care for the baby once it's delivered. Uh, moments later, you are handed a wet, slimy baby who is limp and not crying. Yes, I added slimy to that. Uh, you warm, dry, and stimulate the baby, suction his mouth and nose, and start to get some vitals. His poor respiratory effort, his heart rate is 65, and he's dusky in color. What is your next step? 
we got a choice of give IM epi, start chest compressions, uh, give some positive pressure ventilation via a bag valve mask at 100%, or intubate the patient. And the answer is oxygen, always oxygen. So uh, this probably doesn't happen that often, but first things first is you try to warm, dry, and stimulate the baby. So a lot of times they will cry, take that big breath, um, be very upset that you're messing with them, but once they start breathing, they'll pink up. If they're not, then um, you want to get that option for them. So epi is a little bit down the, the uh, protocol. Chest compressions if their heart rate is low, but the first step before you even do that is to give them oxygen. Many times oxygen gets in and you expand their lungs um, and their heart says, hey, I got some oxygen and starts beating fast and the kid will pick up very quickly. Uh, intubation is, is way down the, the road and to try to intubate a neonate if uh, you haven't done it in a while, I think a bag valve mask is 100% better, 100% oxygen. So the sidebar question is, transport the kid to Children's or transport the kid to the hospital that's getting mom? Oh, that's a great question. I think you have two options there. Uh, children's is probably gonna be a little bit more comfortable with the baby that was born in the field, but you do have a newborn nursery and NICUs kind of around the city. So I guess it depends on where you're going. What would, what would uh, Mount Carmel do, what you used to? We would take the baby. Okay. Well, we have, we have an, I, I mean, in Franklin County, I think every, Every obstetrical hospital has the NICU staffed by children's. Uh -huh. Is that and correct? I mean, no, for Mount Carmel. Have them, yeah, I know so, we have them all around. And so we're, if you're looking at Franklin County, I would take the baby with mom I think uh, even, to the receiving hospital because mom, chances are the baby's yeah. going to do okay. Right. Uh, mom wants to be with the baby. And uh, the hospitals have, have uh, the ability to resuscitate and stabilize the child. I think even like Fairfield Medical has a level two nursery. Yeah, and then for for LMH and FMC, yeah. um, I would I would go to the closest hospital, let them provide stabilizing care and right. transfer. So for me, unless there's really some weird oddball thing, thing I would take the baby to the same hospital as as mom. Let them know you're bringing in the baby. Either baby's fine or baby's not fine. Right. Um, the times I've had a, a bad baby show up with mom. The, the NICU crew comes down and they, they take the baby, I take the mom. So um, it, it, it works well. And I think um, chances are the baby's gonna do fine and uh, the baby can then stay with mom. Right. Whereas, or if the baby on the rare event, it's not gonna do well, the receiving hospital can, has the crew necessary to resuscitate the baby. And they can stabilize and transfer if indicated. The one thing you said about the NICU crew I think it's great because we have the same thing at Children's. If and this is part of, from uh, the EMS standpoint, is the uh, heads up on the way in because we'll call the NICU and they'll be there. We're like, all right, ten minutes will be down waiting, and they'll have if the kid is uh, premature, having distress, having problems, they show up with all their tools and and fancy equipment, and uh, they will help resuscitate and whisk the baby off, and we just stand there and watch the dust settle. Yeah. So it's very convenient, and they can take the baby and, and it will help the patient especially, but then the ED as well to get them out of there. Yeah, we, we, we get very rapid response from the NICU. Yeah. They get no action, they're bored. Yeah, well, <laughs> we think. Yeah. All right, so another trauma question from Dr. Dazon. According to the Ohio Pre-Hospital Trauma Triage Decision 2020, 2019 update, an 80-year-old involved in MVC with a systolic blood pressure of 110, heart rate of 110, respiratory rate of 14, and a GCS of 15 on warfarin should be transported immediately to a trauma center, be transported to the closest acute care hospital for evaluation, have an anatomy assessment of injury and if found to have a first degree burns less than 10%, be transported to a trauma center, have an anatomy assessment if, of injury and if found to have a single humerus fracture, be transported immediately to the closest trauma center. So, what's the correct answer? Correct answer is D. So, the patient's vital signs in themselves probably are not off of an indication, uh, but uh, if you do an assessment, so this is an MVC, if you do an assessment and the patient has a humeral fracture, uh, they qualify for transport to a trauma facility. So. Um, for a trauma triage decision rules for geriatrics, 80 year old gentleman, um, one long bone fracture from an MVC is um, uh, significant enough to go to a, a trauma facility. Um, so when we talk about um, geriatric trauma triage rules, again, 
Trauma triage criteria uh, apply to 70 and up. Uh, these are pretty much the, the, the outliers. So GCS of less than 14 uh, with known or suspected, less than or equal to 14 with suspected TBI. So our patient didn't have a TBI um, and his GCS is 14. Um, so 14 or less with a TBI uh, for uh, adults, non-geriatric adults is 13 or less. That's an indication for trauma facility. Fall from any height, including standing with evidence of a TBI, uh, is an indication for transfer to a trauma facility. Uh, trauma patient systolic blood pressure less than 100. For a, a adult non-geriatric, it's less than 90. This, blood this gentleman's blood pressure was, I think, 110. Um, fracture of one or more pro uh, proximal long bones. So fra humeral fracture or fem femoral fracture um, from an MVC goes to a trauma facility. For adult non-geriatrics, it's two or more proximal long bones. So these are the exceptions. And then any elderly patient, any geriatric patient who's struck by an auto. So pedestrian struck, 70 and up. They could be just bumped in the knee. Um, if they're struck by a vehicle, uh, they go to a trauma facility. And these are all uh, criteria that verified by research. Uh, Dr. Werman at Ohio State had a lot to do with this study. Uh, but these are accepted criteria for mandatory transport to a trauma center unless any of the five exclusions are met that we discussed earlier. So um, this gentleman needs to go to a trauma facility because your assessment shows that he's got a long bone fracture um, secondary to an MVC. If you look at things, I think he was on Coumadin. Um, you know, anticoagulants, in, anticoagulants in themselves are not an indication for trauma facility uh, unless you have uh, clinician suspicion of other significant injuries. Uh, you know, somebody got, uh, older patient uh, fell, has a hematoma of the abdominal wall, and they're on Coumadin. I think clinical suspicion is such that probably should go to a trauma facility. Uh, but anticoagulation in itself is not an indication of need to transfer to a trauma facility or transport to a trauma facility. But I would be highly suspicious. Okay. Um, patient is a 55-year-old complaining of respiratory distress. Uh, you, be, you started breathing treatments with the Duoneb. Uh, the patient feels improved and says he feels fine, doesn't want to be transported. Pulse ox for the patient remains above 94%. What is the proper next step? Uh, determine the patient's capacity to make an informed decision. Transport if he lacks capacity. Allow the patient to remain at home. Convey the need for additional care. Place the patient on monitor and transport. Uh, continue nebulized treatment and reassess lung sounds or consider epinephrine intramuscularly. So this is one of those questions where you can debate the points and many of these answers may be the right decision. But, you know, if you keep in mind what I've been harping over the past couple years, you know, if the patient doesn't want to be transported, one of the things you have to do first is determine whether or not the patient has capacity. So if the patient has capacity, then you can allow the patient to remain at home. Uh, if he has capacity, you still may want to uh, convey the need for additional care uh, and allow the patient to stay at home. Uh, but if he has capacity, you can't place him on the monitor and force him to go to the hospital. You know, patients are allowed to make bad decisions if they understand the risks. Um, continue nebulized treatments and reassess lung sounds. For me, it's kind of at some point you need to fish and cut bait. Either the patient goes or stays, um, but you need to make that determination about capacity. If the patient has capacity and doesn't want transport, I'm not sure I'd stick around and give additional treatments. Uh, for me, that be, then becomes a refusal of care. Um, and then epinephrine, uh, whether or not you give it, really depends on whether or not it's clinically indicated. Um, I don't, you know, for me, it all depends on whether or not the patient lacks capacity. And I think the same is true if this was a 15-year-old patient yeah. and parents were present. Um, you know, the patient's parents have this ability to make an informed decision. But I think from a pediatric side, the other question is, by refusing care, does it suggest neglect? Right. That becomes hard because, you know, sometimes the kid's saying one thing and the parents are saying something else and it just becomes kind of a difficult thing. Um, yeah. At what point is the kid looked that bad that you have to report it? And as EMS, we're mandated reporters. So if you think they're making a bad decision and you think it's neglectful, um, you can't force them in the truck, but you can call CPS and say, I think this is... Yeah. That decision, and then, or for us, it would could be called law enforcement. Yeah. Ask for ask for a police response because 
the, the, the mandatory, mandatory report is to law enforcement or children's services. And for us, it's our easier. experience is it's a whole lot easier to get a cop. Yeah. And they can just assess the situation. And usually just saying that, the parent's like, fine, I'll go in. Um, but I think the, the big yeah. part is make sure the kid is safe. Yeah, for me with children, it, uh, I, I, Mike, I don't know how you do it. For me, it's I think your child is ill, requires treatment. Um, if you do not consent to the treatment, then I'm obligated to report uh, because I think you're putting your child at risk. Right. And uh, again, as providers, uh, we are immune uh, from prosecution or, or legal action if we act in the best interest of the child, whereas we are uh, victims, or we are guilty of, is it a felony or misdemeanor? There is, there is a, I think it's a felony if we, if we do not report suspected abuse, abuse or neglect. So our obligation is to report. I mean, the parent could say, I know, and I'm gonna take the kid in, I just wanna drive myself. And you're kind of depends on how safe the kid looks. Yeah, and it depends on you know if you think the child's sick enough yeah. to go in the truck, then right. going in personal vehicle to me would still That's represent hard. neglect. Yeah, and I'd rather stay on the scene for another ten or fifteen minutes providing care until law enforcement shows show up. All right, question twenty-five. If you're called to see an eight-year-old with nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. Pain started uh, yesterday centrally or periumbilically and now is migrated to the right lower quadrant. All the following are appropriate except um, give, put an IV in and give them a fluid bolus of some saline, uh, give some intranasal fentanyl for pain, check a blood sugar, uh, take to the closest hospital for further evaluation, or take the patient to uh, Nationwide Children's. And this is one of those that we can argue as well over different ways and there's a lot of different uh, answers. The question or the answer I chose to be the the one that I would not do is go to the nearest hospital. The we just got a new abdominal pain protocol, and this kid is um, uh, the classic scenario for an appendicitis. Central abdominal pain, abdominal pain, right, migrating to the right lower quadrant. Um, so it's appropriate to give him some fluids if he needs it. It's a, he's been vomiting. He may be a little dry. It's appropriate to give him pain control. Um, a blood sugar is always uh, a good idea in a a vomiting person. This kid will probably need surgery, and although every surgeon rotates through pediatrics, it seems like the anesthesiologists don't, and we get patients transferred all the time for um, for surgery because they want an anesthesiologist to do it. Now you could argue, I'm one unit, I'm in a very small community, I need to get back, I can't be out of service that long, and it's a far trip, and I think that's appropriate as well. At that point, I would go to the closest hospital. So that's why I said there's, this is more of a discussion question. Um, I think if you have a strong sense uh, the definitive care is going to be at, at children's. Um, I think also, Dr. Z and I talked about you know, radiation exposure. So a lot of the smaller hospitals don't have the ultrasound capabilities to diagnose appendicitis and they will do a CAT scan. Um, some will just transfer away to do the CAT scan further. So there's a lot of things playing in here. It's the end result is if you have the capacity to do it, bring them to children's. If you don't, it's not a wrong answer to go to your closest hospital. Although I circled it in red. Yeah. And it, but this is one of those questions, like you said, it's, it's for up there for discussion. If I have an eight-year-old child at East, I'm going to send the child to Children's. I have very good ultrasonographers 24-7, but we don't do a lot of ultrasounds looking for appendicitis. Um, they are real good if you have somebody who may have an ectopic pregnancy or an ovarian torsion or an inflamed gallbladder or a torse testicle. We're great. We can do it. Um, but I'll often call the tech or call the radiologist and say, I got, a, you know, I got an eight-year-old, 10-year-old, may have appendicitis, are you comfortable on ultrasound or should I send them downtown? They almost always say send them downtown. Oh. So, yeah. and if you're an adult, you're gonna get CT. Right, uh, and it's... Uh, but, but we try to avoid the radiation in children. But if you're, you're, the, you're a sole lone wolf, then you do what you gotta do. All right, good question. All right. This patient seat belted, 24 year old female injured in a motor vehicle at crash. Patient appears to be in her third trimester of pregnancy. Patient has a large avulsion to her right arm with uncontrolled bleeding and a large contusion in the right side of her head. Patient is only responding to painful stimuli with moans. The proper treatment for this patient includes cervical collar and rapid extrication, transport to a trauma center on a straight, rigid spine board in a supine position, TXA, uh, controlled bleeding as soon as possible, and rapid transport. So for me, the correct answer is A and D. Um, patient is not able to uh, 
be adequately assessed regarding C-spine injuries, so we're going to put a collar on. We're going to get her out of the vehicle as quickly as possible. Um, we uh, you know, Transporting the patient to a trauma center, a straight rigid spine board in a supine position is, is not indicated really. This patient, if possible, should be in a left lateral decubitus position. Now, you may need a spine board to help hold her in that position. So. This, this may be one of the times when you would want to use a spine board, but we don't want her flat on the back with the big, pre, uh, with the big uh, fundus, big uterus sitting on the inferior vena cava impeding venous return. So left lateral decubitus position. Again, TXA, like we talked about earlier, is contraindicated in known pregnancy. Um, this patient is, seems to be bleeding out, so we are going to control the bleeding as soon as possible with whatever means necessary, and we're going to get her transported. So the correct answer is uh, A and D. Pretty straightforward for me. A lot of pregnant women. Well, we had to throw some pregnant women in there. And, <laughs> um, 75 year old female fallen while taking a shower. She's having 10 out of pain and pain, uh, the left hip, and you suspect a pelvis fracture. She's 235 pounds. Um, what are your options for medication, dosing, and route? Um, so, you know, how are we going to treat this patient? Uh, fentanyl, 100 micrograms IV or IO, ketamine, 30 milligrams IV, uh, fentanyl, 100 micrograms intranasally, uh, Versed, uh, 5 milligrams intranasally. So what are our options? Uh, any uh, A, B, and C are options. Really, uh, any of those options are good for pain, medica uh, pain control. We do not use Versed uh, for pain control or to augment pain control. So. Uh, you know, we can use fentanyl either intravenously or intranasally uh, for pain control. It's in the pain control protocol. At 235 pounds, I like to round, so she's about 100 kilos, so I would use the 100 of fentanyl IN or IO. Um, ketamine, we can use at 0.3 per kilo up to 30 milligrams, so I would give her the 30 milligrams. You know, if, uh, you know, let's say she was uh, wedged between the commode and the shower stall, or the bathtub and you couldn't move her without significant pain or having trouble with access, another option would be ketamine, 50 milligrams intramuscularly. You know, give it three or four minutes and you'll have good control as well. So uh, at this point, ketamine can be used to either augment fentanyl or it can be your first line drug. Uh, there have been more and more articles suggest that ketamine is your first line drug for pain control is a good option. Uh, I like using ketamine IM for pain control. I've had several patients with past history of IV drug use. They've got a significant orthopedic injury. We have difficulty with IV access, 50 milligrams of I intramuscular ketamine, and they are much more comfortable and cooperative in four or five minutes. So everybody's better off. We can then take time to get IV access. So read the pain protocol. Uh, we have, you have multiple options that are available for managing these patients. And it works for kids too. Yeah. And I saw some article where uh, intranasal route for kids for fentanyl and ketamine is probably now the preferred route. Have you ever seen anything about that? For both of them. I, I love intranasal fentanyl. The article I was looking at was ketamine is not inferior to fentanyl, so it's just as good. Um, we don't use a lot of intranasal ketamine. Probably it's, it's harder for us to, to gather from the pixels. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think you have maybe a little more nausea with the ketamine, but nothing significant. My experience with intranasal ketamine is you end up wearing half of it. Uh, if you're the one who administers uh -huh. it. Uh-huh, comes back uh, at you. And I had a pharmacist argue at a child who needed sedation for a lip laceration. It only needed like three or four stitches, but the child was not gonna hold still. And I think the way of the papoose needs to go. Yeah. So uh, I ordered intramuscular ketamine, and the pharmacist called me up and said, uh, you gotta give it intranasal. It's like, no, I don't. <laughs> I need an IM so I know the patient gets to those. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you can, you can use any of those options. Yeah, work. Suboxone and fentanyl, any problems? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, if a uh, patient's on Suboxone, you can still use fentanyl, but you're going to have to give a lot more. A lot more. Kind of um, be better there. So, uh, you, you can use, actually, there are times patients are on Suboxone, and I use buprenorphine instead, because that's what's in Suboxone, you just give them more. Yeah. Uh, but ketamine works really well with Suboxone, uh, and it's not blocked. And for me, it's, I buy time until somebody else has to deal with the issue. <laughs> I just, we'd probably see more and more people who are on Suboxone or, or yes. equivalent medicine. So yeah, I that's, that's a good point. I love the ketamine option. 
high end ketamine for if you know, have a patient who's known to be on suboxone for opioid addiction, yeah. ketamine is a great option because it's going to work and you're not going to feed into any potential problems. Right. We've had a couple of patients, unfortunately, who've been in recovery and they come in with major trauma and they, they need narcotics and then they, they leave addicted again. That, yeah, that's sad. We've actually had one who overdosed like a month later, hmm. but had been clean for four or five years. Oh, wow. And it was unfortunate, but he, because of his injuries, needed narcotics. Exactly, yeah. All right, so we've concluded with the basic questions. Let's go to the bonus questions that will be done. So I threw this case in there uh, because of... Uh, our addition of Cardizam. So, you know, this is a high school nurse calls you to evaluate an 18 year old male complaining of dyspnea and palpitations. Previously healthy, no chronic medical conditions, and you obtain this 12 lead. So, um, the arrows tell the story. So, if you look at this patient, he's got uh, sinus rhythm, but he has a very short PR interval. Uh, he's got what they call a delta wave, and so ch this child has Wolf Parkinson White Syndrome or WPW. Uh, I've put this in there because as I was telling Dr. Stoner, uh, I am very comfortable with Cardizem, but the one thing about Cardizem that scares me with every patient I have is could this patient have WPW, in which case Cardizem is contraindicated. So WPW is due to an aberrant uh, electrical pathway in the heart. Cardizem works in AFib by blocking the AV node, so the atria are in fibr fibrillating, they're sitting there quivering. And um, the AV node serves as the as the um, as the point that slows the rate down. It, it's the AV node that blocks conduction of the electrical impulses to the ventricles. When we give the patient Cardizem, uh, it increases that AV node blockade, so the rate slows down. Well, if you have a patient with WPW and you give them Cardizem, you're going to block conduction through the AV node which is gonna force the aberrant beats to go through the aberrant pathway, and uh, that can result in significant tachycardia. So shortly after you complete your 12 lead, the patient becomes unresponsive, and the cardiac monitor shows what you see on the right, which to me looks like a, a tachycardic rhythm. Uh, the rate is over, well over 150, mm -hmm. And uh, QRS is starting to look a little funky, maybe some ST depression, which is probably rate dependent. So what am I gonna do for this patient? Uh, so the patient becomes unresponsive. So what am I gonna do? Am I gonna give the patient Cardizem? Am I gonna give the patient amiodarone? Am I gonna cardiovert or am I gonna try vagal maneuvers? Um, well, for me, uh, you know, if you go back to the original slide, uh, the patient's got Wolf Parkinson White um, and Cardizem is contraindicated. So Cardizem is not an option. Could we give the patient amiodarone? Absolutely. Amiodarone for WPW is safe um, and effective. It will slow the patient down. However, the patient is unresponsive. Um, so I really don't want to fool around with amio. And I don't want to fool around with vagal maneuvers. I want to cardiovert the patient. So the patient's unresponsive. I originally had this as sedate and cardiovert, but Dr. Stoner pointed out the patient's unresponsive, so why are we going to sedate him? So if, uh, we're going to quickly apply some electricity, we're going to cardioversion this patient. Um, so the answer, correct answer is C, cardioversion. He made a sedation afterwards when he's mad at you. For yeah. Shock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you yeah. sedate the patient, then there's no doubt they're not going to remember what they did. Yeah. But uh, I, would, I would, you know, I don't remember if we started an IV on the child or not. If you don't have an IV, the child's in that rhythm and unstable, cardiovert, don't try to get access. Get access later. Love it. Um, last bonus question. You're dispatched to local bar for an injured person. On arrival, police are in scene with a 30-year-old female. She's in custody and appears intoxicated. Um, the police officer is there and would like to take the patient off to jail, but he, quote, wants EMS to clear the patient before he takes her to jail. So which of the following indicates the need for the patient to be transported by EMS? So this all falls back on the policy we developed and implemented uh, late, or mid last year uh, regarding clearance for intoxicated patients. Uh, and which one of these reasons is an indication that you say have to tell the officer, sorry, uh, we need to take her to, to the hospital. Uh, laceration of the right eyebrow, a finger stick blood sugar of 105, one episode of vomiting before EMS arrival, so the patient's vomited once and is not vomiting on your assessment. Blood pressure is good, and a GCS of 14. 
And she's basically there telling you to do things to yourself that are anatomically impossible. So uh, what are we going to do? Or what, what's the indication? So the patient has a laceration of the right eyebrow. And you know, if you look at what we've got as a protocol, uh, we have uh, a definition of incapacitating, incapacitating intoxication with any yes uh, answer. So the first bullet uh, is any injury above the clavicles. Um, the second is any signs of acute illness or injury uh, other that, that require intervention. So if the patient's got an angulated fracture of the forearm, yeah, they, they gotta go. Patient who's actively vomiting. So uh, this patient vomited once uh, before your arrival, they're not vomiting anymore, so they're not actively vomiting. This patient has a GSCS of 14, so they, you know, they're better than required, or, or the disqualifier of 13. And the patient's vital signs are essentially okay. So for us, this patient has a laceration of the right eyebrow, that's an injury above the clavicle, that requires assessment in the emergency department. Uh, when we put these criteria together, um, we looked at uh, various published documents. One was out of uh, California, San Francisco. Um, uh, they did a study in terms of what were disqualifying criteria for patients before they could be taken to an inebriate center. San Francisco has an inebriate center that will help patients uh, sober up, what they call it, sobering centers. Um, and one of their disqualifiers is laceration above the eyebrow because they found that any injury, or a laceration of the eyebrow or injuries above the clavicles, they found that uh, patients with injuries above the clavicles are a higher risk to have injuries uh, that require intervention and, and so on. Um, so uh, we added that. And then there's another uh, good uh, study out of Australia. The Australians have some incredibly good EMS um, protocols based on research. You know, you think about Australia where EMS may take an hour or two to get to a healthcare facility. So if they cannot transport patients, it's a good thing. Um, and they have a lot of good research to suggest that any head injuries should be assessed at a facility and not left locally. So for us, if this patient has a, a eyebrow laceration, they require evaluation in the emergency department. So you know, keep in mind, we set this up so that if we're gonna leave a patient with law enforcement, that it's, a, it's safe for the patient and they're not likely to have a bad outcome or a bad hidden event. And for us, uh, any injury above the clavicles is, increases risk for bad things. So at all times, we have to act in the best interest of the patient, even if that means we have to transport an intoxicated patient to the hospital. So in this case, uh, the disqualifier uh, is the laceration. They cannot be left with law enforcement. They have to be transported. So that's the last of the questions. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to send them on to me. Here's my email address. Mike, any closing comments? No, I was stuck on the uh, police at the bar if they were already there when it started or, or showed up because they were called for the violent episode. Yeah. I, I, suspect, uh, I, 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 I suspect they, they were called because there was an unruly person yeah. uh, and, and the, the, the bartender wanted to get rid of the patient. The patient Take already him. fallen once, and the cops got there first. Take them somewhere away from here, not yeah, not here. Yeah. But make sure they pay up before they leave. Yeah, <laughs> man, and that, that made me whether call the cops. Maybe she didn't pay up. That should have been on the thing. Yeah. yeah. E, make sure she pays first. Then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you transport, it doesn't mean you're stuck with the bar tab. Yeah, that's a, that should be in the protocol somewhere. All right. Well, hopefully you've enjoyed our banter. Uh, please do this. Uh, our our expectation is that everybody will review um, the protocol assessment in this video by the end of January. So if you have any issues with that, please discuss them with your EMS coordinator. Thanks again. Thank you.